Well, hi, Jane, and welcome to Piano Teaching Success TV. And and it's great to have you here today because... Thank um, you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Um, Jane, you're an expert in body mapping. So I wanted to ask you a few little questions about that because it's quite um, something new that I hadn't heard of before. So I'm just wondering what would share, uh, share with us what actually got you started with body mapping and because you're very qualified you've got a BMAS you've got an LCCL an AMAS you've done Alexander technique as well you trained in that so you've and you've obviously been teaching for a number of years so what actually led you to sort of look for um, body mapping yeah there's a lot of qualifications <laughs> I um I was doing really well and I was very lucky I had good teaching behind me did a bachelor of music and then I went overseas and did postgraduate work when I came back, um, I had the idea of trying to find out about Alexander Technique because that's something musicians often bring up and I didn't know anything about it. And I went off and uh, did some lessons and I got really interested in that. And so it's kind of like I got so taken with it, I decided to train to be an artist. Yeah. And you've got like two qualifications in it, so you really got into it. <laughs> yeah, but that was a three-year thing, like, like a diversion. And I just thought, um, you know, I was learning about movement and it was making such positive differences to everything about me and in my life. And uh, I thought, wouldn't this be great if, you know, my piano teaching was like this for other people through, through the music teaching? And um, it hadn't been really for me, even though I felt I'd had really good piano teaching. It was very sort of traditional pedagogy and um, we didn't really do much about moving. Um, yes. it, everything was about the notes and the score and, and a little bit of moving, maybe up to about here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, um, uh, some of my presentations to sort of get that across to people, how focus we become on everything that's happening down the keyboard i have a video from the adams family i play a little video of thing do you know thing from the adams yes. family just the hand <laughs> and he's running along a corridor <laughs> and I said, after lots of years of playing sometimes you know i could be forgiven for thinking that was me you know i was just a little hand um because we talked about movement but it was really isolated and it was to do with the keyboard and then Alexander was about your whole body and coordinating movement. And I wanted to find some way to bring those two together. Mm -hmm. And um, I was listening to your interview with Anita yes. today. And she was saying, yeah, we do Kadai and we do ORF and all this when we're younger. And then people show an interest. The next step is, oh, well, you know, you learn an instrument. And um, then the music gets put down in front of you. You sit down and the movement stops. Mm -hmm. Well, body mapping comes along and says, but does it really, does the movement really stop? Because every sound we make, we're moving to make that sound. Sure, maybe they're not such big, obvious movements, but just like we can, um, you know, refine our listening skills, and that's what we're doing with our students over years, becoming really um, quite nuanced listeners, we can become nuanced movers and we can become aware of this whole world that opens up about moving to play music and that's what body mapping was for me and I thought yay I've hit, hit <laughs> dirt. You know, I found something that brings all those things that I'm passionate about together. Awesome and so just uh, give us a brief history because I've never really heard about body mapping until I, I met you so tell us a brief history about body mapping and how it came to be. Yeah well I think the idea of a body map is quite a scientific one and that's been around for since they started doing brain surgery really you know when they have brain surgery and the patient is awake and you know they can stimulate different things in the brain and you know the person's hand will move <laughs> so there's this um very scientific basis that we have a representation of ourselves and how we believe we're put together on the surface of our brain. It's literally arranged spatially as we believe where our body is arranged spatially. And so it's like a map. So that's what a body map is. But body mapping, I think about 20 years ago, the story goes that William Conable, who was a cellist, um, he was invited by a friend who was a violin teacher to come and see a student of hers playing. And she said, I'd like you to come and see this student because I, there's something 
going wrong with her bowing arm and I just don't know what's happening and I, I need some help. So he went along and he watched this girl playing the violin and he said he started to think, what must she be thinking about how her arm is built, how it's put together to be doing that, that movement the way she was doing it? So he wondered and so he stopped her and said, you know, what can you tell me about what you know about your arm? Like, where are the joints and what happens with all the movements you're trying to make to bow? And she had um, an understanding that her joint was actually way above where the elbow joint really was. And she was trying to bow from there. So she was trying to, you know, make movement where there really wasn't one along the shaft of the bone and also try to stabilize where there should be movement at the real elbow because she didn't think that was the joint. And he said, you know, in a way it made sense that she had that misunderstanding because she was growing. Mm. And at some point in time, that joint was about that distance from her shoulder joint. So it made a kind of sense. So he said, you know, there's some help I can give you if you're interested in finding out more about your arm. And he went through where the joints were with her and she went, oh, oh okay, that's good. <laughs> then she could bow. So sometimes, you know, you can change someone's map mm -hmm. um, through that input, through teaching them something about their structure. And to me, it seems a little bit like, you know, the fundamentals of music theory, you know, like to be musically literate, we have to kind of understand a little bit about those structures underneath. And so to be movement literate, sometimes it really helps to learn a little bit about what's happening inside when we move to play. Yeah, exactly. It's a, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So it was it developed in America? It was uh, William and Barbara Conable were in America and then Barbara took that and she really wanted to um, start an organisation that had this vision for changing the culture of piano pedagogy because up till that point any kind of movement information wasn't really part of the normal equation mm -hmm. and she was trying to help a lot of musicians who were injured or in pain or just musicians who really felt there was a limitation to how far they could get in their playing because that limitation sometimes feels like a physical one I know that was that was how I felt and why I went and sought out Alexander work and then body mapping was really felt like I kind of hit a wall and things should be feeling easier than this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought there must be something just information missing and, and that was really um, wonderful to find the body mappers. So we're all a group of musicians. You have to be a musician to be a body mapper. Mm. And we do quite thorough anatomical and scientific kind of study. But because we're musicians, we're, we're interested in it being accessible and useful for musicians. Yes. So it's about being able to package that in a way that um, you can use in the studio yourself in a very simple way, but it makes a really impactful difference. Mm -hmm. So with Alexander Technique, a lot, as you said before, a lot of musicians do look into Alexander Technique, but it's more of a, a generalist um, uh, look at how we sit and how we should be sitting and all the rest of it, but not specifically always related to, pia to playing not, piano. Or yeah, playing not, it wasn't developed specific for, mm -hmm. I mean, it can be applied. Yes. And, um, I just felt like I needed more guidance to know how I could teach movement to people without teaching them Alexander Technique in an Alexander Technique lesson. I wanted it to be part of my music teaching. Yeah, which is really great. So um, the training is also quite intense, isn't it? Uh, you had to undergo quite rigorous. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, I think um, it's self-paced um, okay. and I was home educating my kids at the time. So it took me about three years, but I was happy with that because what you're trying to do with the information is turn it from information into your experience of moving. So that takes some time, I think. Um, and it takes an inquiring mind and an experimental kind of framework. Yeah. yeah. So we did a lot of um, somatic texts and we le learned the anatomy and I studied with 
um, a violinist and a pianist and a flautist and all these various instrumentalists, which is great because you get that different perspective on and you learn something about your that you can apply to piano, but you learnt it from someone who breathes to play their instrument. Yeah. Um, so, so were they from overseas, like different country? They were mostly in the States. And so most of my uh, tuition happened via Skype because mm -hmm. body mapping is not, unlike Alexander Technique, it's not a hands-on um, therapy or anything like that. So you don't need to be face-to-face. But it's fun if you are. <laughs> and it's taught in groups. And so we to be um, uh, an educator, you need to be assessed that you can de de uh, deliver the licensed course, which is about six hours long. You have to show an hour of teaching one-on-one -on -one in your studio. And you have to be able to show that you understand the principles of movement in your own plane. And then you're a teacher. And even though that's very rigorous, the whole idea is that we're going to be able to teach that to other teachers in small chunks. And that as soon as they feel confident with that information and they'd like to sort of weave it into their own teaching, we say go for it because that's the mission of the organisation. We want this information out there and happening in music studios everywhere and that will benefit not only performance standards but performance health yeah which is so a big topic these days it's so it topic, yeah. about that. so we're really really lucky today because jane is going to share with us um how to incorporate body mapping with students in for beginners in some of those beginner courses like piano adventures and bastion so I'm just going to let you take it away, Jane. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, what I thought was a good place to start was that really in music teaching, the main category of movement that we're used to hearing about is what happens with our hands. So the other big category is how do we deliver our hands to the keyboard? And essentially that comes down to balancing on the piano bench and what we do to achieve balance. So I suppose the most common um, advice given to me was to sort of sit up straight. <laughs> <laughs> nothing further was sort of described. So it was very well-meaning, but there was, there was nothing I really could work with in that information. I didn't think it was very high quality information to sit up straight. Um, and so rather than um, what is really describing how I would look from the outside, Body mapping says, well, what's happening inside in order to balance on the bench? And balance is a very dynamic thing. And thank goodness, because we're constantly moving to play. So, you know, being in a fixed position isn't very useful, I don't think. So balancing on the bench, the first thing I would say to a student is, what are you sitting on? And they look at me <laughs> straight to the the bench and say, yes, there's the bench. And then what of you are you sitting on? And they generally look a little shy and start giggling a little bit that, and they say, oh, my, my bottom, you know. <laughs> yes. But what inside are you using to balance on the bench? And you'll get all kinds of answers and not very many of them will understand and there's no reason they should because they've never been taught this before most yeah. times. So I, I asked them to sit on their hands. So I'm going to do that now. And you can do that, Gillian, just sitting on your hands. And what you'll um, sense is that you can feel underneath there some bony structure. Bones. <laughs> yeah, bones. Exactly. So what you're sitting on there are called sitting bones. And keep sitting on your hands for a while. And you'll notice that if you needed to go into the base of the piano, you can completely come onto one sitting bone. Mm. The pressure changes and you can come onto the other. Mm. You can come towards the keyboard and you can feel that the pressure moves at a different at a different point along that bone and you can come right back off them as well. Yeah. So the main thing is that everything above what you're sitting on on your hands is your torso and it can just balance over those bones. That's exactly what they're designed to do. And the reason it works so well is that when you're balanced on your sitting bones, your spine is free. And so 
I um, sometimes explain to people, we use our hands a lot in body mapping to get a sense of our body. So I'll put my hands, uh, one on the front on my tummy and one on the back. And I'll say exactly halfway between those, my two hands is the part of my spine that bears my weight. So it's very central. And then I'll use my two hands on the side. So right in between my two hands, right in my middle, is the part of my spine that bears my weight, the core of my spine. Oftentimes, people have an idea that their spine is at the back, and that's where you can actually feel knobbly bits, but that's about 5% of the full dimension of a spine. Mm. And that's not the part that's made for taking my weight and supporting me. That's the part that just protects my spinal cord and the nerves, very important. But when it comes to managing my mass as I'm sitting, it's got nothing to do with my balance. So when I'm on my sitting bones, my spine is free and it's curved and it's central. So if you put your hands back at your lumbar, um, so one on your tummy and one on your lower back, if you do the kind of traditional sitting up straight idea, you might feel that at the hand on your back, you can feel that the lumbar curve just sort of increased. And then if you roll and have a nice slump the other way, you can feel the opposite. So your back's kind of gone into a C shape. So we're trying to find a balance that's somewhere in between those, not incredibly upright and not really slumped. It's like um, the three bears, isn't it? Not too hot, not too cold. <laughs> it's just nicely in the middle and centralised. So um, when I balance in that way, it's quite easy. And I had a student just the other day and there were a lot of things going on in her movement and we just mapped her sitting bones for her in that same way that we just did. And it really made a difference. And I hadn't said anything about sitting up straight or anything like that. And it looked easy to do, like it does with young children. Mm. And you've got a bit of a, you've got a, um, a uh, what do you call it, bone structure there. So we can, I was actually fascinated when you said then that, because I always think of my spine being at the back where I can feel that. That's right. And, and it makes sense it's, where you can feel. Yeah. But because it's so central and you've got all your organs and everything, lungs and whatever, all around it, you can't really feel exactly where it is. So you have to use, use some kinesthetic imagination. So It's quite thick when you look at that, isn't it, really? Quite thick, yeah. Mm. So for people at home, if you put your hands around your thigh just above your knee and when you bring your hands out, you'll have a dimension sort of like that. Mm -hmm. That's about the size of your lumbar spine. Oh. Big, chunky. Big. I can't get one hand all the way around it. Mm. And it's really strong and it's actually got hydraulics. So you've got um, discs that are fluid filled. And so it gives you buoyancy and the curves make it stronger. And so this whole idea of sitting up straight, there's nothing I've ever studied that supports that idea that you know we should be straight somehow because the curves are part of how our spine needs to be mm -hmm. to make us strong and movable movable at the same mm -hmm. time so in, in any, if anything rather than straight we should be sort of sitting in a, a neutral like yoga talks about neutral positions and exactly. pilates and, and all of that kind of balance yeah mm -hmm. and then we can come away from that point and return to it over and over and over. So balance is really the way we teach it a very dynamic thing. It's not a set and forget. So it's something we need to um, start developing a skill to listen to just the way we listen. You know, when we're saying to our students, keep listening to how you're playing. Um, you can keep sensing your balance on the bench. Mm. Um, and you can see that the sitting bones are these ones, which are not part of the spine at all. And they're not flat. And they're not flat. They're nicely curved like rockers. <laughs> and the other good thing about it is you can see here's the hip joint, which is higher than where I'm balancing on. So my legs are free to move. I'm not sitting on my legs at all. So, yeah, we sometimes get out the spine. Because <laughs> a lot of kids, I, I'm always dragging the piano stool out because they, they kind of sit on the top of their, 
They sit the whole bottom, including the, their upper thighs on the seat. Yeah. And it's taking the balance out the sit bones and putting much more weight into those upper thighs, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, if, if just mapping it isn't enough for them, what I also do is just make them stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, stand up sit down and play. And quite often you'll find that they're already quite differently placed on the bench and you've got them out of that kind of yeah. slumping down thing. <laughs> well, that's and right. Again, if they, they sit too yeah, much on there. Without saying anything about being straight. So, yeah. <laughs> if they're sitting too much on there, um, I always say to them, that's a bench. That's actually not a seat. They think of yeah. it as a seat. So therefore they want to put their bottom and their all sort of upper thighs on it. They sit back in it and I go, no, 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 no. It's only just really a bottom rest, you know, and that's to try and get that idea of, of um, sitting on those sit bones. Yeah. Rather, rather yeah. than the whole of the sit bones and those upper thighs. Yes. Because as soon as they do that, then their back wants to slump, doesn't it? Because that's the weight's exactly not right. sort of wrong. Yeah. I always say that's great for watching TV. Yeah. <laughs> But not really useful for playing the piano because, and I think the other thing with students I do is let them slump and play and try to notice what is that doing for my playing versus when I'm balanced on my sit bones, oh, I'm actually more maneuverable and this is, this is, makes this thing easier or whatever. So going back and forth between the two teaches them how to gauge where they are at any one time. And, you know, we, we see them for an hour or half mm. hour a week and the rest of the time it's going to be up to them to know what mm. they're doing. And so it's the beginning of developing that sense of moving while they are playing that's going to be really vital to them being able to manage themselves, be self-sufficient and um, really start to enjoy moving at the piano more. I think mm. one of the things about the piano, it's a strange instrument. <laughs> I love it. But... You know, it's, it doesn't move with us. You know, the interiors move, yes. But more than any other instrumentalist, I think we need to know about how to move around. I can't even reach 88 keys without moving mm. um, to, to get to them. Mm. So I think it's a, you know, it's fixed and the bench is fixed. And that's a good thing because when we have fixed surfaces, we can remember that, we, we're the ones who are, are moving around them if we are stable but also dynamically balanced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, show us how to, how to um, and I think one of the other things I was just about going to say is the, I really like the way you're um, putting the students through these um, exercises so they feel the difference because otherwise we're into, sit up straight, curl your fingers, play the tips, you know, we're the one, nag, 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 nag. But if, yeah. if they can actually feel, oh, yeah, when they slump, actually, I feel a bit depressed, not depressed, but, you know, I feel a bit, uh, and I play like, uh, and when I sit up straight, I feel more free and whatever. Oh, yeah, I feel a benefit of that. It's worthwhile investing and being aware of it so that I'm on a time practicing and doing that. I'm actually in that position. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's not another thing they have to remember. Yeah. It's something they're choosing to do. Yes. And that makes a difference to people's movement anyway, doesn't it, when it's their choice. To, to do something in a particular way. So um, the other, only other thing I like to mention is that in, I say in school you learn all about gravity um, and gravity is um, a force, but for every force there's an equal and opposite force and no one talks about the equal and opposite force, which is, I like to call the normal force because it sounds like a superhero. <laughs> it goes by a few different names, contact force and all this kind of stuff, but I like the normal force and some of the um, boys I'm teaching, they like that too. I said, you know, um, the normal force is there providing you with an upward buoyancy, just in the same way that gravity is pulling you sort of downwards. So when you're con in contact with your sitting bones and the bench and the floor, then you can begin to sense and that upwardness through your bony structure. And that's a really nice feeling too, to feel supported at the piano without having to make any effort because you know the forces are doing it for you <laughs> <laughs> exactly and one of the things that um this is not only an investment in being able to play um piano really well which of course it is uh, but it is also um the ec economically you know all of the physiotherapists and all the rest of it they are also 
and all of the seats that you get, the um, eco ones and all the rest of it, that's what they're actually trying to do. They're trying to get you into this position. So, yeah. so it's, um, it's an investment in good sitting at the computer, good sitting at study time, anywhere. Yeah. You sit properly at the piano on those sitting bands with the balance position, with the weight on your feet and all the rest of it. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. It's going to leave you healthy, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah you're doing them a big favour. Yeah. <laughs> so I like to include this information from the very first pieces that are in the kind of piano adventure series. And everyone's familiar with this sort of scenario where the, the text is teaching kids to find different keys along the piano. So this one from Piano Adventures, the primer level, two black ants, um, the kids are finding the two black notes down the key. So what I like to do is extend it so that we say, yes, we're playing the two black notes and you're noticing how you're going to balance to reach them. So you can start up higher in that left hand and just extend the range you're using or you can swap hands so that the right hand is playing the bass. So they're learning how to balance even when they need to make a sort of a spiraling movement in the spine. And that's what's coming. You know, that's what's really coming in pieces as they advance. But when they're at this stage, obviously the pieces have to remain very simple. I just don't want the ideas to be thrown out until they suddenly appear in grade four and, and, they're none the wiser, you know, that what happened to my piece that was nicely here just in front of me. <laughs> so the same, there's the old clock and there's a nice duet part and um, they're usually playing right hand up the top, left hand an octave lower. So just swapping it around helps them a little bit or making it much higher and much lower. So they're starting to move a bit as they play. So I'm really This would be really good. Oh, sorry to interrupt. This would be really good with if you've just done that, you know, what we were just talking about before about doing getting on your sit bones and feeling those sit bones and really and then going straight into that where they can really be focused on because this is really simple what they're doing with their hands. Yeah. They can be really be focused on the rocking on those sit bones from one to another. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I'm sure everyone out there is, you know, super creative teachers, they'll work out all kinds of ways to um, be able to incorporate that. Um, uh, the other thing I like to do is um, take that whole idea and swap it around as they're doing something a little more complicated. So they might be playing um, a piece. This is um, all with third fingers and it's just called a study. This is from the Russian school of piano playing that I like to use. Um, right hands, left hands. bit of the balancing happening but when they're when they're good with that I like to swap it around and say okay we're going to start with the right hand and every note I want you to swap hands so, it's just more fun <laughs> well, so, um, anything that you feel you can extend the range so that they need to work with their balance a bit more or change hands around so that they're moving more and being used to that I think is a good thing at those really early stages mm -hmm. and that way they keep that kind of flexibility that they bring to the piano when they're really little ones and you know they're all over it <laughs> yeah and I also like that you're um, breaking them out of the music <laughs> we don't have to stick oh my gosh those dots only say this but you know this this is a pattern let's extend that pattern this is how we can do it it's yeah. sort of even just very early stages of creativity and just expanding. We don't have to glued and fixed. Yeah, that's right. And so we looked a little bit at the um, Amy B technical work level one, since that's such a big topic at the moment. <laughs> and um, in pr I mean, everything I played in here, it's relevant too. But the things that really took my eye in preliminary, there's um, this little piggy and off to market, which is, the second exercise and there's on the opposite page extra for experts tic-tac-toe and that is something where there's a lot of um, lower arm movement and it's just nice to feel stable while your arm is moving so you're not kind of getting thrown off board same 
anything in the lift. So that was one that I sort of caught my eye. Um, in grade one, a flying leap. So you're shifting a little bit along the keyboard and mm -hmm. you're doing busy things with your hands but you can also be aware of your balance on the bench and your sitting bones and what's happening in terms of shifting of weight. So that was a nice one. I suppose I should demonstrate one when you're not. This is a good one. This is in a grade three, my special place. And in this one, it's just a chordal, a little, a little chordal piece, kind of like a chorale, I think. And um, the performance notes are about what you're doing with your wrist. So to have a, a gentle up movement of the wrist and down for each chord. And I think if I don't have a sense of um, being really balanced and strongly supported, I can do the wrist movement. I tell my students, you're supported from underneath and you're very buoyant while your hands are doing this so that you can sustain this beautiful long line that Joe's written here. in grade four where you're using the, often the same finger to do repeated notes. If you're really sensitive on the bench, you'll notice you're bouncing a bit, which is kind of fun. <laughs> so they were just sort of at that um, beginner to intermediate level and um, just to be sure that you're including it right from the beginning you can pick them up and see in whatever creative way that you feel are working for you and that piece for that student today. Mm -hmm. um, there's only one other thing I do and I have a, a, a student who has some learning issues and for them I um, purchased one of these ah. which is a, called a sit and move push it. And I kind of like it so much I use it with all my, all my students. Um, so if you're having trouble sort of with a student becoming aware of what's happening in their balance, sitting on one of these exaggerates everything. So when you come onto one sitting bone to reach the top of the keyboard, you're really moving a lot and you can kind of hear it with this um, cushion. So I have them sit on that for a little while and then when you take it away they go oh yeah I really was moving a lot I didn't notice um, and we want them to notice so that they are going to use the bench for being fixed and not make some kind of fixture in themselves and have to move around that so that's a fun tool to use as well I've got my personal training makes me do uh, squats on those I have to stand on it and balance <laughs> So I could imagine, yeah, on the on the stool, it's actually having to get them to perhaps even engage their abs a bit, maybe, would it? I don't what know. I, I just think it exaggerates the feeling of, oh, I've got to find some kind of support in that centre. Yeah. And um, also, I need to have my feet on the ground or on some surface. Yeah, <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going flying off the edge. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a really good tool. And where do you get those from? Um, I got this one from online. I bought it at Sensory Tools. So they have a lot of toys for um, kids on the autism spectrum and things like that. Um, but yeah, I enjoy it too. <laughs> <laughs> we can have fun doing this, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, in really, in pieces where you're moving a lot, you can have something like this or sit on a sports ball. It, it really engages your legs in what you're doing and you start to realise that you can use your legs to manoeuvre around the keyboard as well. Mm. And that's kind of what I think we're going to be talking about next, which is... Ah, legs. good. Let's tell, tell us about that. <laughs> well, I think... It comes down to, again, that support. So um, that normal force, you can sense it through your feet. Often we're not taught anything about our legs with piano. I mean, yeah. um, you're lucky if someone mentions, you know, keep your heel on the ground while you pedal. And that's kind of it. <laughs> How many people do you see I, do um, the whole, like, the whole thing lifts up? <laughs> that's right. When I first sort of, um, when I was studying body mapping and um, someone said, you know, what's happening with your legs and I started to have to wake up to what's happening in my legs and I mean a lot of balance information comes up through your feet mm -hmm. and so um, I really wanted to challenge myself with something tricky and see if what happened with my balance when I had to move my legs a lot so I, um, I found this Scott Joplin rag and you're only supposed to um, use your heel to tap on the floor in one of the sections but I wanted to make it really challenging. So I, I was practicing by lifting my whole foot. So I thought I'd play that today. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I brought a little stool to make a bit of a noise so that my tapping's part of the music. Oh, cool. What's a, what is this piece called? This is called the Ragtime Dance. It's a it's a typical kind of Scott Joplin. It's really nice. That kind of thing you're familiar with, but uh, you get to um, a section later on, and the stomping is part of the rhythmic interest of the piece. I reckon, I reckon I'm making that tapping sound would make the whole thing just turn up the difficulty level. Yeah, that was my idea. So I'm not suggesting that you necessarily leap straight into that <laughs> with your students. But what I did find looking through Amy B was that by the time you hit grade four, all of a sudden there's a lot of use of the full range of the keyboard. And so there were a couple of pieces I wanted to show from grade four. Mm -hmm. The first was um, Rainy Day, and that's by Lowell Lieberman. That's the list C piece in grade four. And in this piece, um, there's a figure played by the left hand, and it's up, you know, basically in the second octave above middle C. And the melody interest is in the left hand in the middle of the piano. So we're kind of crossed over. And the figure is quite challenging, I suppose. Um, but mostly I was thinking if I didn't move to play this, if I didn't move my whole body, I'd really be kind of stuck doing this. Mm. How would I achieve the, the musical outcomes that I, wanna, I want to with this piece? So really, um, here's where we're not only moving to one side on that sitting bone, but we're also kind of making use of the ability of the spine to spiral so that I can move freely in this way. Sometimes I say to my students, you know those um, wind mobiles, the, uh, the, wooden, the wooden ones that kind of have that spiralling movement? Yes. I, I bring up that image that's quite helpful sometimes. Yes. So.
them more speed. But that that was something you know that I thought, wow, they're doing that by grade four. That's quite a big ask. Mm. And again, in the performance notes, it's more like the traditional kind of pedagogy where we're talking about everything from here. But I don't think there was much advice about <laughs> about that. <laughs> and, and I think sometimes as teachers we can do it ourselves, but we don't actually know how to explain it. We, we, we see a student do it and we think, oh, no, that's not right. But we don't really know how to take them from where they are to perhaps what we're doing. We're not even really perhaps even aware that what we're doing is actually, I haven't thought of it like that. We actually are on one cheekbone and we are sort of spiralling. When you start to think of it that way, then it's easier for you to start actually to explain it to your student. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, a lot of my experience of going to lessons was that the teachers seem to be able to do it and, and they say something and you try your best. But yeah. uh, if you can't do it straight off, it's well, go home and practice it. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, it didn't necessarily mean I could do it by the next week. No. Just missing information. And yeah. so... And, and really, to some extent, your teacher was missing information because she didn't know what to say to help you get to where you needed yeah. to go. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure they could tell it wasn't happening. <laughs> didn't know what to say about it. So, yeah, it's just about equipping yourself with this whole extra dimension that, you know, it's not going to be every bit of every piece where you're going to talk where you're talking about it. But when there's an issue, I say to my kids, when you're having a problem with a piece, what is happening is you haven't found the movement yet that makes the piece sound the way you want it to sound. So we keep looking. Mm. Mm. Well, that's good. So even yeah. now, even with all of your expertise, you're starting to still thinking about it and having to look at with each student with whatever is happening. Thinking, hmm, hey, yeah, well, I mean, every single piece is different, isn't it? Yeah, it's got all got so the movement, the sequence of movements you need to achieve that are different for every single piece. And yeah. that sort of brings me back to why I, you know, I love teaching in this way because I feel like over time I'm equipping that person to be able to go and play any piece they want to play. Yes. And I don't have to be there or anyone to help yes. them by the end of the But you're almost um, questioning or helping them discover what they need to know, not necessarily always fixing it. Yes, exactly. And, I mean, that's what we're doing if we're teaching well in all those other elements of music, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. You know, making them self-sufficient. Yeah. So this is just Do another one. Yeah, doing yourself out of a job. That's really the, the main thing, isn't it? I'm good at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You, I mean, you're really the ultimate goal. Paul always says this. My ultimate goal is to become a coach. Not their teacher. Yeah. Yeah, which is also good. So you've also got another one, which is Machines on the Loose. This is one of our faves. We love this I piece. know, isn't it a great thing? <laughs> and I know that Paul does this whole whole body movement thing with this, um, getting the kids, you know, to know, feel in their whole body, five-eighths, moving to six-eighths, seven-eighths and all of that. Yeah. And I just thought this is lovely that the music doesn't stop there because yes. you come to the keyboard, you look at the score and it has... I've got to play right down here. So we've got to deliver this um, driving energy to a part of the keyboard that's really not as easy to do as what we might have hoped for. Yes. <laughs> but it's definitely worth it in this piece. So again, if I was reaching, it would be quite hard to play. It's okay, but um, it's much easier if I come onto that left sitting bone. And here's where, you know, my leg really is helping because I'm going to be so far off on that one sitting bone that the diagonally opposite leg is like a counterbalance. Yeah. So I still can feel very stable even though I'm right down here and doing all this busy stuff. So you don't have quite so stable um, a right foot, but we can become really sensitive to the pedal, just the way we become sensitive in our fingering. So the pedal can still feel like a stabilising place for your foot to be. So that was just one example. And again, I was quite surprised.
surprised that by fourth grade it was like, oh, this is really, this is well worth it because it's such a wonderful piece. Yes. But it's really challenging in terms of balancing and, and without this information, you don't know what it's doing. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Well, these are fantastic ideas that we can use in our studio, like immediately, straight away. Yeah, and that's the idea. Yeah, and I really, really loved, um, you know, when we first started off with the whole balancing on our setting bones thing and that little exercise you did. I mean, I think every, everybody, everybody should be doing that with their student today. <laughs> yeah, you can do it anywhere, you know. Yeah, and I love your little cushion. I love your little cushy because that's really cool. That's like, it really does sort of um, uh, ramp up the sensory input, doesn't it, you know? That's right, yeah. Mm. It's no longer just this information. It's not about anatomy. It's about how I experience myself balancing. That's yes. where we're aiming for in body anyway. It's Absolutely. It's totally about you and your experience. Yes, and how it feels. Because some kids are really in touch with how things feel, but a lot of kids are not in touch with how things feel. They're a little bit, um, if they're not overly kinesthetic, um, yeah. those, those children, you know, with the visual auditory kinesthetic things, the highly visual ones, VKA or whatever, are, are often not really aware yeah, I don't think it's a huge part of our culture either. I mean, no. If you go to school, you learn the five senses. Mm. That does not include kinesthesia. Mm. Why not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have a student saying, you expect me to like be feeling things all day. You know, all day. I said, well, you walk around all day seeing and hearing. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, yes, I would like you to be sensing your movement all day. But let's just start with a few questions. Yeah. a few prompts in the lesson and work from there well ultimately they are sensing they're just not focusing on it they're not aware of it or they're not bringing their center of awareness into that yeah perhaps i, I think so i mean one uh, body mapping colleague said to me it was almost like the more developed my oral skills became the more deaf i was becoming to how i felt while i was playing oh. and that that was a really sad sort of thing and, and body mapping brought her out of that and so yeah the student's experience needs to be in my view included in the lesson and that's really respectful of what's happening with them and at the same time helping them develop a skill that will be of help in all areas of their mm. life as well as music. I like what you said about that because um, you know traditional piano teaching has always been read play which is really more being about the read than the play, really. Um, yes. You know, get the information through here, just focus completely on the music and all those dots and do not play anything. Do not diverse from that, there's the dots. Um, and then, you know, we really also, um, the auditory and being able to play by ear is just such an important skill and, and listening to what we're playing and getting that feedback loop happening there. But then there's the third, you know, visual auditory. If we're looking at that model of visual auditory and kinesthetic as being our learning senses, the kinesthetic, yes, it's sort of how we feel about something and imparting our um, emotion and whatever, but it's also how we move and being aware of how we move and how that helps influence how we sound as you were saying before so yeah. it's just there's integration of all of those senses isn't yeah it? it's wonderful isn't it i yeah. i have I've come up with we're going to sort of fuse our hearing and our feeling so we're going to call it healing <laughs> <laughs> well that's true that's a nice way of thinking about it <laughs> so um am i right that you're about you're the are the only qualified person in australia with body mapping yeah there i'm um, I think body mapping is something that's incorporated in some other somatic trainings, but um, in terms of uh, body mapping for musicians, as trained by the Association for Body Mapping Education, yes, I'm the only one in Australia at the moment. Awesome. You've got a handout, haven't you, for, um, for us today, something that everyone can download. So tell us about that. Yeah, uh, so in body mapping, we sometimes use drawing as a way to find out what we usually how much we don't know about our structure. So um, it's really something that is about not being correct at all. Um, it's not about checking your anatomy book first and then doing the drawing. <laughs> drawing how you feel or sense that part of your body. So you're trying to um, see where you understand correctly, where you might have just a very vague understanding, but you need some more detail, or where you've actually got something quite um, in the wrong place or the wrong size or whatever. So as part of today, um, there are two pages. And the first is a nice blank image, uh, an outline of a body. 
Mm -hmm. And what we instruct people to do in classes with that is to, well, for today, draw um, how you would sense your spine, what you think about your spine. So it's not um, about your drawing ability. So you're really looking at um, where does the spine begin? At the top, where does it end? How is it placed in the body? How large is it? What else can I put on my drawing that I know about it? So the idea is you do a nice drawing and we did a, a workshop at Orange Conservatorium and um, the, we did this drawing exercise and one of the teachers there uh, left his drawing behind after the workshop and I thought, well, I'm gonna use that. <laughs> so um, I can include that as part of the thing. It's just to, to let people know this is someone someone's drawing of their spine. And this chap, he's written little notes on the side. So I can tell you that he's had some injury to the cervical spine. He's had a prolapse disc. But interestingly, it hasn't really resulted in, by his drawing anyway, um, him knowing a whole lot more about that part of his structure. Um, his spine is very sort of um, small dimensionally. Um, it's more towards the back than the middle. It doesn't really come down quite as far as it <laughs> would in his body. So there are things there that he could that he could learn. So the second part of the handout is um, in the Association for Body Mapping Education, we use a medical illustrator and she has an image that she's filled out about the spine. And if you're just printing them out, what's nice is you can um, put your drawing in front and you can have the other one behind. And if you hold them up to the light, you'll be able to see, you know, oh, I had my spine so far back, but it's really, you know, in the center in this second drawing. So it's just a, it's a fun way. And sometimes that really works with kids. They like to draw. I'm not currently in the setup where I have people in a waiting room very often, but I used to just have a big scrapbook there and had some images pasted in and then some blank things. And while kids were waiting, they could have a draw and, and yeah sort of work out what they already knew and what they didn't. Yeah, and I think um, sometimes even just seeing it um, is just uh, seeing it regularly is yeah. like brings that awareness into our, into our, um, you know, into our brains about what, right. what it really is. Yeah, and mm. I, I mean, I do that in my studio at home. I'll have pictures on the walls. So mm. I have a beautiful green apple core and I use that to just remind um people that their balance is through the center really is and every everything else is around just like the flesh of the apple but mm. the core is really at the center or you know a beautiful picture of a tree because I often think of spine as a mm. bit like a tree trunk so little things like that that just help them to remember and help you as well when you're teaching because I mean a lot of us are sitting to teach as well so yes um, if you want to sit more comfortably um, maybe some of this information Yes. That you as you're teaching and um, I would also recommend moving around a lot I move a lot when I'm teaching uh, I don't want to sit always close to my student because I can't see what they're really doing in terms of their balance so that's another nice tip about it for the teacher's own health yay yes <laughs> Yes, I've seen a lot of people uh, comment about, oh, I've really got my, you know, my back is sore or whatever. And I'm in that, you know, what can I do? I'm sitting all the time. But you're right. You know, you really can get up and also be thinking about how you're sitting when you're on the chair as you sit, as you, as you teach. I know yeah. from my, my studio, uh, my office downstairs, I don't have a, I have a seat, that, one of those ergonomic ones. It's like a saddle that I sit in. And uh, I often think, well, wow, this is giving me, like I would sit at the piano. You know. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah. And I know if like I've got the setup with just a single piano, so you're sharing the instrument with the student and if you're not careful, you can really sort of end up demonstrating quite twisted yeah. information from here down just because, you know, it means you've got to ask them to get up and then you sit down there. But I just think if they're moving more in the lesson, I'm moving more, that's got to be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. That's great. So if teachers are wanting to know, I'm sure a lot of people really want to know a bit more about it and they might have their own little specific pieces of thinking or a specific student that doesn't seem to be kind of moving the right way and what have you. How can they get, how can they find out more from you? How can you help them? Okay, well, um, from next year, I'm starting online learning and I, 
I've been a little bit apprehensive about all the tech stuff with that, but I'm getting my head around it slowly. And um, so much of my teaching I received online and it was excellent. And um, I just thought that's, that's a way that anyone from anywhere in Australia or even overseas can join in. And so that's happening from next year, as well as groups, which is lovely to do. I mean, group learning is so much fun. And now that I'm here at the beautiful Sydney Piano School, this is an ideal venue. Mm -hmm. And um, we can do groups face-to-face -face here. Mm -hmm. As well as that, um, I'm in the mountains, so people can visit me in the Blue Mountains. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to say as well, I mean, a lot of body mapping is... You need some help, you need some support, but it's self-directed. And so there are some really good books that I can maybe include in your the notes for the show, show that okay. people could use once they get started and they can use it in conjunction with the online courses. Um, and I'm just always pulling them out. The pages are well-worn and um, they're really useful to have because not everyone travels with, you know, a model of a spine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I bring my bag and my students said, it looks like you've come off the plane. You have so many things with you when you come to teach. <laughs> That's right, because you come from the Blue Mountains all the way to um, yeah, the city coast. Yeah, and, and I just, I have some unusual teaching tools, some of which you've seen today, but yeah, it means a, a, a large bag is necessary. <laughs> well, we're going to put a link to all of these um, uh, tools and um, the and how you can um, contact Jane and some of these books and everything all in our show notes and um, we'd really love to thank you Jane for sharing your expertise with us today there's some fantastic takeaways that teachers can use right now in their studios just this afternoon so thank you so much thank you too and if you want to know more about this and other teaching ideas please check out blackrockmusic.com.au and our teacher magazine area and also you can join Piano Teaching Success um, our Facebook group because we're always posting um, wonderful interviews like we've just done with Jane today. So thank you, Jane. Oh, thanks, Gillian. It was fun. I really okay. had a good time and thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. We'll see you next time. Okay, bye. Bye.